speaker view. That'll be the easiest way to view today's presentation. And also, if you have questions for our speaker, Dr. Bates, um, at the end of her presentation, if you could use the chat function on Zoom, and we will have somebody monitoring that so that we can uh, recite your questions here. And welcome to all of you in person as well. So I apologize, we're just starting to get used to this kind of hybrid version of our brown bag lectures here, so we'll get better at it. And uh, again, to my people on Zoom, I don't know that you will be able to see the entirety of the PowerPoint presentation, so the end of the screen might be cut off, but I know Courtney's a very dynamic speaker and you'll be able to see and hear her. So um, I'd like to always start by doing a little run through of some of the events that we have coming up. And actually in September, we do have several events coming up. So it almost feels uh, normal in some ways. So uh, on September 18th, we are getting back to our regular monthly classic movie nights. Um, and on the 18th, we will be screening Ball of Fire and that will be here in the community room. It starts at seven o'clock. It is free and open to the public, but just like our brown bag lectures, we are asking that you call to make a reservation in advance because we are limiting our capacity in this room to allow for social distancing. The following evening, September 19th, we will be holding our farm to table dinner this year out at a beautiful historic property in Genera, Ohio. And this is an outdoor dining experience. We are also putting in place a few additional precautions for this year, but it's a delicious five course meal, all locally sourced local ingredients with wine pairings for each course. Um, and in inclement weather, we will be in the historic barn that is on site there. Um, it's gonna be a wonderful evening. We'll have some live music. The chef this year is uh, Jenna Hagard, and she is an assistant professor of food and nutrition at Bluffton University so we're really looking forward to that evening and it is a fundraiser for the Hancock Historical Museum we do have a few seats still available if you're interested and you can make a reservation here at the front desk or give us a call or you can visit our website uh, also starting on September 18th and running through the 26th we have our alternative version of Oktoberfest this year uh, Oktoberfest Finley is usually our largest fundraiser of the year and one of the largest single day events in our region. Uh, last year we had 6,000 people downtown, so of course we couldn't do something like that this year, but we have come up with a pretty fun alternative plan. So starting on the 18th, we have 10 downtown local businesses that will be participating with their own uh, celebratory events. They have some unique menu items, some um, German beers on tap, some live music, um, and in most cases, these businesses are offering a kickback of their specials to the Hancock Historical Museum. And our week-long celebration will then culminate on September 26th with Schmidt's Sausage House from Columbus, which is one of our favorite vendors usually at Oktoberfest. They're going to come up and do a full day-long drive-through here at our campus. Um, and you'll be able to pre-order your food from Schmidt's and then come through and pick it up. And our, um, our slogan this year for Oktoberfest is 2020, the year it all went to schnitzel. So <laughs> we have, if, you, if the slogan resonates with you, we have some commemorative t-shirts and steins that you can purchase uh, on our website, oktoberfestfinley.com, or you can go through the Hancock Historical Museum website as well. I think that's all I have for you. So we do have something of a busy month coming up in September, and we certainly appreciate you supporting the museum with some of these events. I do see some um, unfamiliar faces today, so welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, the Hancock Historical Museum is able to kind of weather the storm that we're all going through as nonprofits right now because of our members and donors. So if you're interested in membership, there's some more information at the front desk for you. And now I will introduce our speaker today, Dr. Courtney Bates. She is an assistant professor of English and uh, the director of the Writing Center at the University of Finley. She is currently working on a book project, Pushing the Envelope, Mark Twain and the Rhetoric of Fan Mail, which analyzes key thematic and rhetorical uh, patterns within Mark Twain's career-long correspondence with his readers. At the 8th International Conference on the State of Mark Twain Studies in August of 2017, she presented to the person sitting in mourning Twain's use of private letters in mounting a public relations campaign. In 2018, she was awarded a Quarry Farm Fellowship by the Center for Mark Twain Studies, which was a month-long individual writer's retreat in the Crane family home where Twain spent summers working on his own writing. And I'm sure she'll tell us a little bit more about that. Um, we are so happy to have her with us today, so would you please help me to welcome Dr. Courtney Bates. Thank you. Now I wish I had some pictures of Quarry Farm in my slides. Um, I want to start by thanking you all for being here. It's Thursday and lunchtime, and 
maybe your heart aligns with mine where you think, and that would be the perfect time to talk about Mark Twain. <laughs> so I appreciate you being here. And if you see here, Mark Twain and his readers, what I think is really interesting about Mark Twain is that you're here listening about him because his relationship was, I would argue, one of the key pieces that means we're still interested in him today. That is, without his readers, we don't have Twain. Right? We have old books that no one wants. But also, it was Twain's um, career-long relationship with his readers that wrote him fan letters that helped him both monitor and create his literary status throughout his life. So I think we don't get Mark Twain without his readers and without his fan letters. It's, you might say to yourself, fan letters, um, this is a term that we have today that's familiar to us. At the time, like late 19th century, the term fan mail didn't exist. It started to appear, if you heard the word fan, it was associated with baseball fanatics. It took some time before we had actual fans in the way that you might think of like a fan of Star Trek or someone who goes to a Comic-Con. Nevertheless, the practice of being a fan was pretty widespread. So. You might say, how did I find, find these fan letters, and how do I know they're fan letters, especially if that term didn't exist, fan letter, at the time. And so first, these exist at the Bancroft Library in Berkeley, California. It is an archive that holds most, much of Twain's personal correspondence and papers and manuscripts. It's almost in a complete floor of their library where they collect and maintain these documents. If uh, several Christmases ago, you got, for example, uh, the big brick sized Mark Twain autobiography volume one for someone for their birthday or as a present, they collected and edited it. When I went to this archive, I would say, bring me the incoming mail so I can sort through it to see if I can find fan letters. And so I literally got milk crates like this with hanging <laughs> file folders. And I would have to take out each little, end, each little file folder and open it up to see what was in there. Well, if it was letter from a family member or a friend or a bill, I put it back. And those are pretty easy to spot. Uh, here I am with my kids. They're waiting for me to come out of the archive at the end of the day. So little! <laughs> that was in 2012. This whole group project, the Mark Twain project that holds this material, their eventual goal is to digitize everything and put it online. But digitizing his fan letters is pretty low down on their list. <laughs> so if I want to look at them, I have to go there and photocopy them or take a digital picture. Eventually, though, all of it will be online. I'm so excited to that day. If I'm talking about fan letters and you're interested and curious because you just want to read a bunch of them, Kent Rasmussen did an edited collection about a year after I went. There's about 200 fan letters in there, and he really cherry-picked some of the most precious, adorable, insightful. So if you leave thinking, oh, I wish I had some more fan letters to read, there's my book recommendation because I'm an English professor and I'll give you some ideas for what to read next. When I pull them up though, I get a letter that looks a lot like this. And if you are right now pitying me for reading 19th century handwriting, often not on lined paper, <laughs> often not with such excellent handwriting, and you pity me, I thank you, because it's a lot of work looking at these fan letters. To make it easier, here's a transcribed version, and I want you to hear how easy these letters are to identify. I picked this one because it's from Ohio. Mark Twain, dear sir, perhaps you will excuse me for writing to you when I tell you that for the last three years, although unknown to yourself, you have been one of my physicians. A physician certainly ought not to take offense at hearing from one of his patients. For the last three years, I have been confined to the house with paralysis of the lower limbs, nearly two years of the entire having been unable to walk. 
Now that I am somewhat better, I wish to thank you for the pleasure with which your writings have given me. I firmly believe that the good solid laughs that I have had over them have done me more good than all the medicine I have taken. And if it be a comfort to you to know that you have helped a boy pass three dreary years of illness, may that comfort be yours, respectfully yours, Emerson O. Stevens. And so this has a lot of features of a fan letter that makes it super easy for me to identify. I don't even have to read the whole thing before I know I want a photocopy or a picture of it. Because it's this opening move. Perhaps you will excuse me. A stranger. They don't use the word stranger, but unknown to yourself. So there's almost always in a fan letter this opening move. It might be the opposite. Dear Mark Twain, you must get lots of these letters, and I'm just one more. <laughs> right? So sometimes they say, this must be really strange for you to get this letter. Or, of course, you expect to get this letter. But in any case, fans are writing letters. They perhaps thought of them at the time as letters of admiration from strangers. And so you can see why I prefer the term fan letter. <laughs> right? It's a little bit easier to work with. But this happened, and he got so many of them from his entire career. And I argue this is why we have Mark Twain as an author. Not only because people admired him, but he listened to them admiring him and used that to make informed choices about his writing. Another gift, thank you, Mark Twain, is that he often saved the envelopes and wrote a note on them. So that one that I just read has a little note on the side, from a lad. That's what he wrote. And sometimes these, sometimes there's no note, but sometimes they have lots of details. So for example, no answer. Well, that's super interesting. I want to know why some letters didn't get answered. Thanks, Mark Twain. Because we don't always know, right? Which is the letter, which is the response. We may not be able to match them. From a lad, that's the one we just looked at literary aspirant, so many people wrote him seeking for his advice about how to become a famous author. Do you like my work? This one says, this is an Orion style of ass. Orion, not Orion, pronounced, pronounced diff differently. If you're at a Mark Twain cocktail party and you mention Sam Clemens brother, Orion, <coughs> then you're in the know for the pronunciation. And if you say Orion, because you don't know, they'll gently correct you. <laughs> so, uh, Mark Twain, he had a fraught relationship with his brother, Orion. If you're curious about that and why Sam Clemens would write that about his brother on an envelope, you can read this book, Mark Twain and Orion Clemens, Brothers, Partners, Strangers. So, another book recommendation. So that's how I spot them. I go there, I pull them out of an envelope, there's a little bit of a sentence that says, that's a fan letter, I want it. And I want to say, early in Twain's career, he recognized the value and power of celebrity, and he worked with that power for the rest of his career. Here's, oh man, this is so much fun to tell you guys about. <laughs> early, so before he published Tom Sawyer, which is what maybe you knew him for, when he had just published Innocence Abroad and Roughing It, so two books in the hopper, some lecture tour work, but not the most famous American author at the time, scrabbling to get his reputation established. He invented something because he was also an inventor. He loved inventing things. And this thing that I'm showing you is his most successful invention. It is a self-pasting scrapbook. I am guessing almost all of us in this room remember a time when we used to lick stamps. Yeah. So what he did was made a scrapbook that was pre-gummed, and all you had to do was moisten the page, and then you could put your scrapbook material in it, and it would stick. And you didn't need a pot of glue or a brush or all that messy stuff to maintain your scrapbook. Because he maintained a scrapbook. Okay. So already he knew about people's desire to collect and arrange material, often associated with celebrity. He's, he's going to get better. Mm -hmm. Here are all the ways that he created this scrapbook in various kinds of finishes. Super fancy for a present, 
maybe use them a lot, so less fancy. He sold these throughout his life, and they made him lots of money. When he advertised it, this is an example of an ad. Notice how interesting this is. He could have, first you're like, I can't read that handwriting. <laughs> Maybe if you had it in front of you and you gave it some time, you could read it. But what it is, is a facsimile of Mark Twain's handwriting with his autograph at the bottom. And just wouldn't you love to have that for your own personal collection? <laughs> right? right? And so, one, he's selling his scrapbook here. He's saying to his advertisers, I certify that during many years I was afflicted with cramps in my limbs, indigestion, rheumatism, and enlargement of the, river, the liver with periodic attacks of inflammatory rheumatism, complicated with St. Venus's dance. My suffering was so great for so many months that I was unable to stand upon my feet or without assistance or speak truth with it. <laughs> so sick, it makes it easy to lie. But as soon as I had invented my self-pacing scrapbook and began to use it, <laughs> In my own family, all of these infirmities disappear. <laughs> In disseminating this universal healer among the world's afflicted ones, you are doing noble work. <laughs> and I sincerely hope you will get your reward, partly in the sweet consciousness of doing good, but the bulk in cash. <laughs> and some of that is in his cash, right? Because he's making money off of this, even though he's writing this ad to the publishers of it. And you can sort of hear this echo, and I'm going to go back, to this letter who talks about your humor was healing for me, right? So it's possible that this person is echoing that language. It's also just part of the time where people read humor to make themselves feel better. I've got a closer match I'm gonna show you for fans really feeling like this is a connection. But here, once you've bought an advertised scrapbook like this, you start, I would love an original signature just like that and I would paste it in my Mark Twain self-pasting scrapbook and I would show it to everyone who came to my house right so you can see he's both giving you the object to do the thing along with the desire for what you would put in it pretty clever uh, this is just a fun fact in 1885 the St. Louis Post Dispatch claimed that he made $50,000 which is like $200,000 today for all of, more than his other books combined. So again, celebrity helps you make money. Okay, that sounds great. Fame, money, what's not to enjoy? But I do wanna say that this is actually an ambivalent relationship. So some things positive, some things negative. I'm gonna show you some of the negative things for this uh, cultivating of literary celebrity. One, you get things like this. This is a printed request. Dear sir, the favor of your autograph is respectfully solicited. Yours truly, Clarence Ash. With a return envelope and postage that is still in the archives. So clearly, Mark Twain never sent his autograph back to this person. But he wanted to keep the request. Right? throughout his career already archiving, and now we have it in the archives, the signs of his celebrity. But you can also see he's annoying. Good God! <laughs> Super annoying to get this kind of request, in part because this doesn't hit, dear Mark Twain, you're my favorite author. It just says, you're the little fishy I want to collect today. I can't even be bothered to write you a handwritten letter. You get a form letter, give me something fancy and valuable. But you also know if there's someone like that who has this stuff and you've made your, their list for their weird collection, you're pretty famous. And if we laugh at this person for being ridiculous, maybe not, right? I did a quick Google search of like, hey, how much is a handwritten Mark Twain letter selling these days? I don't know if these are real or fakes, who knows? but there are hundreds and sometimes thousands of dollars. So that one person in Iowa seems like it's a good deal, right? Take a blank piece of meaningless paper, 
put your handwriting on it, and now it's worth more money, more than if it were printed money. Okay, Mark Twain even imagined he mocked up what could have been a form letter from all of these things that came into him over and over again. Dear sir or madam, this form letter is to address all those literary aspirants that wrote to him saying, dear Mark Twain, tell me how to be a famous author just like you. So this is the form letter because he got so many of those. Dear sir or madam, experience has not taught me very much. Still it has taught me that it is not wise to criticize a piece of literature except to an enemy of the person who wrote it. Then, if you praise it, the enemy admires you for your honest manliness. And if you dispraise it, he admires you for your sound judgment. Right? So you could get this form letter joke back. He never produced it. Right? So I don't know if this is a thought experiment. But you can see it's weighing enough on his mind that he's cracking jokes about it at least to himself. Here's another example because it's going to show you two things. One, a rare postcard that he kept that was a negative review. And two, some weird thing that is happening right now when he decides, I'm going to keep it. So I'm just going to explain what you're looking at. This is a postcard. Here's the front of it. Here's the back of it. It's torn into three pieces. Can you see the tears? And then he took the three pieces and put it in an envelope <coughs> to save it. He didn't burn it. He didn't throw it away. And he labeled it offensive postcard about the Gilded Age, <laughs> which was an early career novel that he co-wrote with Charles Dudley Warner, who at the time was a little bit more famous than him. <laughs> Right? A little bit more sort of well, genteel and well-known for his genteelness. But here's what this postcard wrote. I'm not reading the whole thing, just part of it. This unhappy reader is like, that's a terrible book. And it's terrible because you wrote it with this guy. There are, in the book, three good articles. For these, I give you credit. There are 997 wretched, infernal, stupid, idiotic ones for which I give the poor lunatic credit. The rest of the book, now it's gonna get worse because we're gonna end in a racial slur. The rest of the book was by a carpenter or a Chinese or worse. And Mark Twain's like, yeah, that's terrible. I am gonna tear it in half and then save it forever so people know just how annoying it is. Thanks, Mark Twain. Back to why celebrity is not the awesomest. So again, this is early in his career. It's 1868. He hasn't done a lot of the books that he's famous for, but he's got a job writing a column for a magazine called The Galaxy. And so he publishes an editorial that he highlights with the headline, One of Mankind's Bores. And when I am reading this, I want to claim that he's talking about fan letters, even if that term isn't there. So listen. I suppose if there is one thing in the world that is more hateful than another of all, to all of us, it is to have to write a letter. Mm -hmm. A private letter especially. There we need fan letters. Of this, and business letters, to my thinking, are very little pleasanter. Right? So not business letters. We're talking about private letters. Nearly all the enjoyment is taken out of every letter I get by the reflection that he has to answer it, la la la. He's going to, in this column, give three sample, what I would call fan letters. One by a Wisconsin gentleman, another by a little Kentucky boy, and then finally a young man from Tennessee. And these are exemplifying a range of fan letters that he got. I think the young man from Tennessee is like, you mentioned a strange nail in one of your pieces. What nail is it? For just the annoying letters about minutia. The little boy from Kentucky, a cute letter. It says that I think the boy tried to mail him a cat. Which was, and he was like, well, it was a terrible, oh, there was a good getting a cat in the mail. It was a, a, a real hellfire of a cat. And the Wisconsin gentleman is also ridiculous for a, a reason that doesn't come to mind right now. So two out of three are terrible letters. 
And then Twain later on says, talking about this pile of fan letters, the pile of letters grows so large that it begins to distress me. The unanswered letters would surely begin to have a reproachful look about them. Next, an upbraiding look. And by, by and by, an aggressive and insolent aspect. And then he would say, I would attack the pile and give a full five and sometimes six hours to the assault. That I believe, that Mark Twain spent regularly five and six hours on a given day answering fan letters, I think is real. I do fervently hate letter writing. Okay, now another fan letter. Because I've given you lots of evidence for why this is so tedious. Oh, but first I want to show you how messy his desk is. <laughs> right, when he says, they're all piling on my desk, he did have a messy desk. This is him imagining writing and composing a tramp abroad. This is him at his actual desk. I wish I could lean in and see how many are fan letters. Like, just, let, me, let me see, what's that? What's that? What's that? Anyway, if only we could hop right in. So here's a letter, dear Mark. It begins, I don't care if letters are a bore to you. What? This person is definitely name checking that one editorial, right? I don't care if they're a bore for you, either to answer or receive. I've had so much amusement from your travels, memoranda, etc. I want to thank you for it, and I'm going to do it. Accept then the hearty gratitude of one who feels indebted in a higher degree than his subscription to the galaxy or purchase of Innocence Abroad cancels. Right? So we're deep in the weeds of the name check here. I read your article in the galaxy, and even if I buy it, I owe you more. As a fan, it's worth more to me than the purchase price. Isn't that nice? Oh, look at this. This cute thing. I'm going to rotate this letter. Mark Twain's note. It says in his handwriting, received on a low-spirited day and preserved it for the comfort it brought. Later in his biography, Albert Bigelow Payne, who was his biographer, is going to say that Mark Twain told him, quote, I can live for a month on one good letter. Hmm. So now we know some of the weight that these fan letters can bring to him as a comfort. Okay, I'm about to show you what seems like a super strange, out of the ordinary fan letter but then I want to walk it back and tell you, actually, this is not as strange as it seems. And so I've blown up a little bit of the header because this is mailed from the Lancaster Insane Asylum. Okay. And I want you to see this big, this letter is pages and pages of tight, getting tighter, scribbling handwriting. Oh, flip the page. More of it, more of it, more of it. Okay, so Mary Kelly is writing to Twain <coughs> in these letters, and she is saying, Mark Twain, she says, angels and devils are visiting me. Also, I hear voices, and somehow the stars are talking to me. And what they, they tell me, it is my job to usher in a new age of world peace. I am going to host a dinner with major religious leaders of our time. We will sit down and we will hammer out our differences. Indeed, you have to come and serve the turkey. Also, send me $5 for the turkey. Okay. So... And I don't think this is a ploy, right? These letters, which are often disjointed and suddenly like a sentence will end and just like hymns will appear, right? Transcribed hymns and then we're back into a letter. But she says at one point, so now you don't have to read the handwriting. Don't laugh at me, sir. Maybe you think a patient in an asylum can't cook a dinner. For the gentleman I mentioned, I assure you that I am or was a good plain cook. 
And although and I am in an asylum treated as the most insane person there, I have the right taste and feeling still. It is your duty, sir, to let me know whether it is divine inspiration or influence from the devil that makes me do so. The do so is probably fires that happen to get set and burn things down around her that she doesn't quite understand. But I have a sense that she's starting fires. <laughs> Right? So she's saying to him, what is going on with these visions that I'm having? You have to tell me, Mark Twain. Also, come to dinner. <laughs> now watch what happens. First letter, from lunatic. <laughs> Here's the surprise. From my lunatic, sent her the $5. <laughs> she's going to write back. From my friend, the lunatic. Listen to that level of extended friendship. Right? We're going from a lunatic to my lunatic to my friend, the lunatic. <laughs> She's going to keep writing him over time. And some of those annotations then maybe show a decreasing level of engagement, I would claim. From the poor lunatic. Moving forward, from the lunatic. The lunatic, this isn't his handwriting anymore. I think it's Olivia Clemens, his wife's handwriting. It might have been a later secretary. I don't know. People at the Mark Twain Project, though, are really good with their handwriting stuff, so I should probably ask them. And then this other thing happens, where Mark Twain takes that letter and replies to it, her personally, he sent her the money, but then he publishes in a local paper about this experience. He publishes his reply to this person. He publishes it in the, Farming, in the Bradford Reporter in 1880. He prefaces it, and then he begins the letter, Well, Mary, my friend. There are a couple of things I want to say about this. One, he gives her a different name. So he fictionalizes it, right? Because you don't want people to know that about you. So he's protecting her identity. When he describes the letter he got from her, he does not say that she's in a, a lunatic asylum. He gentles it. He gentles it. He doesn't say that she's asking him if the devil, which is what she's asking, if devils or angels are harrying her with these visions. He gentles that too. He says that she's inspired by a, re a recent warm discussion between Catholics and Protestants. This, you get a hint of the mental disturbance. The letter was long, covering a number of closely written pages and stated that the writer had been favored with visions and inspirations from heaven. So he's cut hell right out of there, right? So he's giving the setup here. He begins this, well, Mary, my friend, and he closes is it? Believe me, your friend. And then, as he's answering this, he's going to say a little bit that I would argue both says, please send me more fan letters. I love them. Also, don't expect me to reply to your fan letters. <laughs> right? So it's like a little mailbox that is both opened and closed. So he says to her, you must think I am a very, I, I am a slow correspondent. And the truth is, I am a very busy person and a very lazy one. I don't feel half so hurried and bothered when people never expect an answer right away. Later, he's going to tell her a lie. He says, I only answer these kind of letters on George Washington's birthday, <laughs> which is not true. He answers them all year round. But if you wanted to say something cute that would get people not to expect an answer at all or right away, that's a pretty nice lie to tell. Oh, let me give you, I'm going to give you one more thing, because now I want to get into the meat of the letter, right? Because I've, I've talked a little bit about that kind of peekaboo he's doing, inviting, disinviting. But listen to the meat of the letter. I'm going to read it actually out loud. Not the whole thing, don't worry. First, he says he can't come to dinner. <laughs> he's like, you have your dinner, I can't make it. Now I'm quoting. I have to stay home and stick close to my work, else this nation would become so ignorant that in a little while it would break one's heart to look at it. 
No, you and I have our separate duties in this world, Mary. Your line is to humanize the clergy, and mine is to instruct the public. Let us not interfere with one another's functions. I have the most kindly sympathy toward you and your words, and perhaps that is a better contribution than mine. You say, pity me, and indeed I do. I wish I could tell you whether those are genuine visions and inspirations, but I cannot be absolutely certain. They seem to me to be just like all the other visions and inspirations that I have ever heard of. And so I think that you may be rest assured that yours are as perfect and true and genuine and trustworthy as any that have ever happened in the world. Now let that comfort you, Mary, and may that give peace to your troubled spirit. Right? I read that in the archive. I had no idea it was coming up. I sat in the archive and cried. Right? And you can hear how Twain is working in many levels, right? When he says, <laughs> let's not interfere with each other's work, right? You can see where he's just saying, like, man, five or six hours of answering fan letters is a lot of work. So maybe I don't want that much work to do. But at the top of this reply, if you stuck on an envelope, Farmington Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut, Mark Twain, that is mailing address. So at the minute he's saying, fan letters are a little too much for me, by the way, here's my post box, right? And I do think the comfort that he's offering is very genuine and actually moving without him saying that she's right or wrong. That's a really fine line to walk. And so when we begin to look at that letter and think that she must not have good taste yet, by the end we're like, maybe she does. And maybe he does. And maybe this is why he's going to get a lot more fan letters. Because people can then imagine them be recipient of these kind words when they are troubled. And I would add that when you read Mark Twain like a novel or maybe some of his essays, you do have readers consistently say, it feels very strange to feel so connected to you. Maybe you're writing about Hannibal, and I live there, and I recognize it, and I feel like you know me, but actually we're strangers. And being strangers when feeling seen and known is uncomfortable. And so I'm going to write you this fan letter, and you're going to write back to me, and then that strange gap is going to close. And if Twain is doing that over and over again in his career, not all the time, because, oh, God, and what an ass. Right, but he's doing that a lot of the time. He's got his pulse, really, his thumb on the pulse of readers and what readers are thinking of when they imagine him as an author. And he may not agree with them all the time, but he's definitely listening to them. Okay, I have not checked the time at all, and maybe it's time for Q&A. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to pause here because this is where I said, what are we doing for time? We're doing for time. And I want you guys to be able to ask your questions, if you have any. And also no pressure because I'm not taking attendance or grades. Yeah. Were there uh, any letters that he uh, threw out or did he keep them all? Oh man, I don't know, right? If he threw them out, how would I know? But <laughs> there is some indication that there are more letters, right? So like um, if Twain says, I've got a hundred of these letters and I have five then, well, is he exaggerating or are some letters missing? He also had lots of secretaries at various points to help him manage his correspondence. And at least like a couple of trunks disappeared that had other things in them, but maybe fan letters that I wish we had. That biographer Albert Bigelow Payne quotes from some fan letters, but we don't have the original. So where did they go? And then other times he quotes from them and we have the original. And so, yeah, there's some missing. And very rarely can I be like, this is the fan letter and here's his answer. That's fun. Oh, good question, yeah. Um, two of the people I like 
to quote the most are Mark Twain, perhaps the great American author, and the great American philosopher, Yogi Berra. <laughs> yeah. Many of, uh, many of the things that Yogi Berra is said to have said, he never said. Yeah. Is there any indication that, uh, uh, that some of the uh, famous quotes we get from uh, Twain might not have been his or might have been altered a little bit? Oh, man. I am so glad you asked that question. And if you weren't lucky to be here early like Tom was, I gave him the name of a website called Twain Quotes, twainquotes.com, you just put it in. It's, there's a Twain scholar who literally has just made a commonplace book of awesome quotations by Mark Twain. So if you need one to like round out a birthday card or something, <laughs> then you're in luck or a speech, whatever the topic is, you just sort of crib from him. But if there's Apocrypha, she'll tell you She'll tell you. So that one quote that you and I were joking about with Cincinnati, they're like, well, we can't really find that like in a newspaper that's contemporaneous. So we're not sure if he really said it. The rest of you want to know the joke. Okay. Mark Twain says, hey, if I, what would you, someone asked him, what do you know, what would you, what would you do if you knew the world was going to end? And he said, I will get on the first train to Cincinnati because Cincinnati is always 20 years behind. <laughs> but, so oh, did he say it but also I think like man I, I wish he said it right and I think sometimes if you're lucky enough to say something funny enough that people won't attribute to you then maybe they give it to Mark Wayne and that's still a win in my column that people think you might be as clever as he was yeah. I know that uh, Mark got uh, suffered into a lot of scams sure. uh, and inventions and all that stuff uh, you mentioned his self-sticking scrapbook. How successful was that, are, are you aware? Oh, it was super successful. It made money for him for the rest of his life. And like, it's great to have royalty checks. Now it is fun, it's super fun. If you are like, wanted, if you're like, here's some peer reviewed journal articles. Mark Twain is really well known for some of his failed experiments. <coughs> the most famous being the page typesetter. So, so this what he famously set type in a print shop and he was working on a typesetter that he threw buckets of money in for us it'd be like a million dollars um, at the same time there was a financial recession that he was at the time that he was spending all his money on this experiment and so it's what precipitated some of his bankruptcy was shoveling money into this experiment mm -hmm. now he was betting on the right horse Right? Like it was the wrong invention, but the right moment to be investing in new print technology. Right? He just bet on, he was at the right race. He just bet on the wrong horse. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and so that's actually why he went on late in life, another around the world tour. And so we get some of his really interesting traveling writing and experiences being in other countries. So it's like, yeah. Well, that page setter didn't work out, but we got the book following the equator out of it. So good for us. <laughs> yeah. Other questions or just like random Mark Twain things you want to ask? Yeah. Do you know when in his career? I mean, he must have been famous, but when he went to Israel and did that. Oh, yeah, when he did a tramp abroad. That's early career for him. Um, but he also sort of went back to that and did like updated versions. And A Tramp Abroad, um, he, he, he got a lot of work out of that text. So when he first went on the trip, he sent letters back as a newspaper correspondent. And then he rolled a lot of them into his actual book. And then later he would do sort of updates. You know, that A Tramp Goes Out Again. It's not the title, but close enough. And so um, it really helped us know who he was. And I think, too, because he's writing letters as a journalist, it's another look into how a world of letter writing is the thing that helps his celebrity ship set sail. Yeah. Ooh, that's so much fun. Yeah. Yeah. I got a barn out there in the country. Uh-huh. It's got 1881 on the barn. Well, well that's when it was built. Uh, I mean, just ask him, was uh, Mark Twain in this area ever? Uh, mm, 
Yeah, and no. Oh, yeah. So he did world tours, and some of his stops are as close as like Columbus and Toledo, where he was giving lectures on the lecture circuit. Um, if you walked out in the museum, though, and you learned that we have these four amazing theaters, you kind of wish Mark Twain were here, right? If we had Sarah Bernhardt stopping by, why not Mark Twain? So I secretly hope maybe someone got something wrong and he was just downtown for an <laughs> evening. Yeah. And don't quote me on that that really happened, but if I start a rumor, I can live with it. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm gonna subtly check for time again. That's fine, I was gonna encourage more people on Zoom too. Uh, I'm not sure if everybody knows. Hi Zoom folks, does anybody have a question that you'd like to ask Courtney? You can use the chat function. Um, if you do, or if you kind of raise your hand, we can unmute you. <laughs> Nothing right now. Okay. Just double checking. Yeah. And those of you that logged in at home, I'm glad you're here too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for being here. It's really great. Ah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks, everyone. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs>